Adam Wexler, host of the A Team for Sports Talk 790. Welcome to Combos Court. How are you feeling today, man? Feeling great, man. Great to be here. It's great to have you. I, of course, you're here to talk Houston Rockets basketball. I think when it comes to tanking, there two things can be true. Um, I don't think it creates the best culture, but also at the same time, it does create young, exciting teams. Do you see that as well? And what do you think about the current state of the Houston Rockets? Well, there's also several different ways you can go about describing tanking. And, you know, the Rockets have a roster that is clearly not going to be very competitive, but right. the design of it is a lot different than the other teams who are begging to get to the bottom of the league by saying, man, we got too many good players that could help us win. Let's go ahead and sit them down for 30, 40, 50, 60 games. Uh, that's not what the Rockets did. They played their players all the way till the last 10 days of the season, basically. And it's because they went, they drafted four guys in the first round. Uh, they went out and took Kevin Porter from the Cavaliers. Uh, they spent money to go get Christian Wood a couple of years ago, and he may or may not be back. And uh, I think they just have it. They weren't going to win. So they said, well, let's just play these guys. And they played them and played them and played them and, and landed them near the bottom of the draft. The culture is something most people on the outside seem to have an issue with here in Houston. But I don't know that they know a whole lot about what is actually going on here. There were some hiccups. There were some problems. Culture is built long after the losing. It's not built from the losing. You're not really gaining anything from a culture standpoint from losing, clearly. But you don't have good players. That's all there is to it. When good players arrive, when you draft well or you are in a position to go sign guys, then the culture of uh, acceptable culture, I guess you will, winning culture, then it gets developed. I don't think anybody's too concerned that the culture in Houston is, is that of losing, considering they've been one of the best teams in the NBA for a decade. And then James Harden decided that he was going to go ahead and make it extremely difficult uh, on this team. I do think they made the right choice, though. Uh, trading for players would have been the wrong choice. Trading for future assets, draft picks, et cetera, in my opinion, that was the right choice. It is going to cost them wins now, but I think it'll pay off later. What did you make of the John Wall situation this season, and what's the status with him? And that's the one thing that throws a wrench into that whole discussion I, I just got through. I, I do think it was a mutual agreement, but I do think clearly John Wall wanted to play basketball last year, and if he didn't have a contract like that, which he wanted to earn – but was obviously an impediment to moving him, then he would have been moved elsewhere. He would have played elsewhere. He wasn't interested in taking less money on a buyout, and uh, they weren't interested in, in paying him all of the money that is on his contract to go play somewhere else. So obviously he stayed. Uh, I also don't think 60, 70 games of John Wall would have made a whole lot of difference from a winning and losing standpoint. And I think that's where some other people might disagree. I think the Russell Westbrook playing 60 or 70 games for the Lakers kind of showed people that. And I do think their ability to help teams win is at that point in their career. Uh, I don't think he'll be back. I do think they'll figure out a better situation. There's obviously a lot less money due on the contract when he opts in for that uh, final year. Uh, so it was a weird year for that. I can't believe the NBA has had that happen now multiple times. There's a guy who went off last night in the NBA finals. What did he do the year before? He was told by Oklahoma City to take his paycheck and not play. So this isn't the first instance of it, and I'm surprised that it is something that is done, but doesn't look like it's going anywhere when you have players like this making that kind of money. So with all the great young guards you have, you felt that was a good situation for them and their development for John kind of to sit it out. Just back to the beginning, playing is the best way to develop and yeah. playing behind John Wall or aside John Wall. Well, I do think he provides value. This isn't an anti John Wall stance. He provides value from who he is. His knowledge of the game is through the roof. His yes. desire to know the game yes. is outrageous. No, I, I don't know of a player. And they've had some, you know, Chris Paul's been through here. Eric Gordon's still here. Uh, John Wall probably watches and studies more basketball than anybody else. He probably should have been an analyst at some point this year if that were allowed. But uh, he knows the game, and there was some value in that. But he did spend some time with the team. I uh, thought it would be more than it was, uh, but that's just the way it went. I don't, I don't think it was anything that they lost out, Porter Green or any of their younger players. Josh Christopher lost out on development by not playing alongside and practicing all year alongside John Wall. So um... – Let's shift away from the past and go towards the future. First of all, John Wall is definitely a basketball savant, a great basketball mind, but let's shift to the future. Paulo, it looks like to me it's destiny for him to land as a rocket. I don't know if you feel that way. How do the Houston Rockets feel about him? How do you feel about him? And do you believe it's destiny as well? I do think it is because unless another team, and I guess it's Oklahoma City or a team outside the top three, 
is so in love with somebody else, which I really don't see happening. I do think Smith and, and Holmgren, they're going one, two. And I do yes. think it's Smith one, Holmgren two. Um, you'd have to have Jaden Ivey or Shaden Sharp or, or somebody else really blow somebody away after their career. And in Sharp's case, there is no career. So it'd have to be in a workout or something. I, I just don't really truly believe that's going to happen. I like a lot of the players outside the top three, but I just don't think they are as good and as strong as the top three. It does look like Van Carroll will be the guy. They'll probably, you know, landing inside that top three was huge for the team that had the worst record in the league to make sure one of those three guys would become a rocket. And I would definitely lean towards Ben Cara as we sit here today. Yeah. Well, I agree with most of everything you said. I would think that Chet will go number one just from the upside, but you could be right. And do you feel like this is almost a great situation for the Rockets? Cause they really don't have to make a decision out of the three. They I mean, play. yes and no. Yes. They don't have to make a decision. So that sounds like, well, then the pressure's off or the angst is out and you're not sweating through it. But if Smith and Holmgren are significantly better yeah, players, right, then it's right. not so great. And, and I don't know that they'll be significantly better, but it's so clear that they're going one, two, I think that kind of indicates that they're awesome. And uh, I think their future is a little bit higher, slightly higher ceiling than Bancaro. But Bancaro is a player you can build around, win with, be your number one guy. That's what they had to have uh, in their team's development. So to, to have the chance to land one of the three uh, is huge. But I, I definitely think there's a there's a top three, but there also might be a top two. <laughs> we will see. We will see how it all plays out. I think Paula will definitely be the best available with that said. And you always go best available in the draft. With that said, I love Alperin Shangun's game. Is there any concerns with having him and Paulo on the court at the same time defensively? I mean, they're not going to be able to rim protect uh, early on, probably the way you might like. And we're watching how these teams that are still playing in the NBA postseason and now the finals – uh, they obviously aren't looking to their bigs to score. They're not posting them up. They're not using them as a focal point of their interior game. But Robert Williams is an elite rim protector, an elite rebounder. Draymond Green is arguably the best interior defender uh, that isn't over seven feet in the NBA. And they don't have anybody like that. Shingun, I think, can become a solid defender. I don't think he'll ever be an elite defender. I think Ben Carroll might actually end up being a better defender if his foot speed is what I think some people think it can be, his lateral quickness, things like that. Uh, they had trouble playing Christian Wood and, and Alpin Shangun together, I think, early in their season. I think as the season went on, they figured out there were better ways to set the floor with those two. Uh, they clearly couldn't do it with Tice and Wood at the beginning of the year. That's why Tice is on the Celtics now. Uh, they do need to figure it out. But like you said, it, it's not a deterrent. You can't not take Bancaro because you're concerned about that. You'll, you'll figure it out or or there's a third bid you'll have to go out and add that brings that particular element to your team. So going into last year's draft, I thought Cade should have definitely went one, but I was really high on Jalen Green as well. And I talked about his upside a lot um, going into the draft. What have you seen from his development? Somebody asked me recently, what do you, what do I think his upside is? actually now so you know it's a year later and I still think in my opinion it's all-star and all-nba from the glimpses I'm seeing as a young rookie what are your thoughts on his development and his upside I think those things can definitely be true he has to get bigger that's the, the mm -hmm. biggest change in his game that has to come uh, I think all the other parts come along with it he will work hard he needs to you know be a little bit better at beating guys off the dribble that comes in time that comes with experience and you know with all the moves that go along with it um, but he's going to be a top flight shooter it's very rare that a guy comes into the league and can do that and I know he got off to a pretty miserable start uh, shooting yeah. the basketball so at the end of the year people will look at his season numbers and say well I don't know why people think he could shoot well the majority of his season was spent at such a high level shooting in 36 37 38 percent and better that's the player I think that returns to the court when you know year two begins and more you know I don't think he has the size of Anthony Edwards I right. do think he can play like Anthony Edwards. He runs the floor exceptionally well. He's a fantastic finisher on the break. The mention of him getting stronger, he needs to finish better at the rim in traffic, and that's what strength will do. But uh, there, every part of his game, I think, is there to develop. I, I think all those things that make you uh, all NBA caliber, uh, he has all those parts of his game. It's just a matter of developing it. Obviously, he's young, young, young. These 20 and 19 and 20 year olds they played have a long way to go. But when they get there, they'll still be young, 23, 24, when uh, they're maybe starting to reach their peak. Yeah, Anthony Edwards, in my opinion, is a future MVP. I talked about that before. But one thing that him and Jalen Green are so great at is getting separation on the shot. Like they could really get their shot off at will. Just the next step for them is the decision making. 
Yeah, and he, I think, became a little bit better playmaker uh, in knowing when to shoot and when to, I think, give the ball up. At the beginning of the year, he gave the ball up a ton. Most people were saying, let's get him the ball more. He needs to shoot more. And I think that just came in time. And another guy who did not play college basketball, I know he was in the G League in the bubble. And I think that was good because of the way it was constructed and how you're just basically going all basketball all the time for weeks on end. But it's a super short season. So the time from being a high schooler to becoming an NBA player actual on court time was just so limited. So I do think that it's not stunting him, but it's just something he didn't have that other guys might have. Uh, future is absolutely incredibly bright. I, I think it's fine. And it's actually good for the league that there's some discussion because go to Cleveland, go to Toronto, uh, go to a couple of other places. They're not saying, I wish we had Jalen green and it's not a knock on Jalen green. It's that, well, we have Evan Mobley and he's great. And we have Scotty Barnes and yeah. he's great. I think we're going to look at those top guys from this draft class and they're going to be a pretty good group at the top that excelled and the Rockets were lucky to get one of them. Great draft for sure. Um, what do you feel the biggest improvement areas outside of, of the decision-making are for Jalen? Probably being able to finish. Uh, he needs, he just has, he's, he, I don't think he was pushed around, but you know, he gets bumped. The other guy's bigger, almost every single player he's playing against, even the guards, even at the perimeter. Yeah. Uh, you were mentioning his ability to create space. He's got a great step back already. He has a, a, a shooting motion that, you know, when he's delivered the ball properly, the shot goes right up. I, I think they yes. worked on his shot. And I think you, anybody who's watched him during his development from an you know AAU player to the G League to here, you can see the difference in the way he releases the ball, yes. gets that shot into the shooting motion. And that's the other part of this is development. This is what they're working on in season. And so it's going to have an effect on his performance. And, you know, by the end of the season, it's it's exactly what they wanted when he was hoisting up 30 point games regularly. Yeah. Like Jalen Green in a different way, though, KPJ's talent is undeniable. He has the athleticism. He obviously has the skill set, could score with either hand in the lane, could get to the mid range, could shoot the three, even could play make. Um, what do you feel his ideal role is going forward? I don't know if I'm in the minority or not anymore, but I still think he's capable of playing in the backcourt with anybody because it's maybe not an ideal spot at either spot, but he's so good at doing both. At the end of the season, they just basically turned it over to Porter and Green and just let them go out there and get you know whatever they could and make the team that they had around them at the time, whatever three players were out there with them better. And I thought it was the best KPJ has played all season. His assist numbers only went down slightly, but it wasn't because he wasn't trying to create for others. They just, the you know, shots weren't going in elsewhere. Those two guys were carrying the team every night. They were filling up the stat sheet in every way. And you're right. It, it's hard to believe the actual skills that KPJ already possesses. He sees the floor very well. He is an exceptional ball handler. He's got a great handle. He really can do everything, but not quite at an elite level. And there's obviously the mental side of the game, just really off the court that he's acknowledged it's, it's been a struggle for him. That's why Cleveland made him available. He had some issues here in Houston that don't seem to linger, didn't seem to linger even at the time, but they're obviously not good for building through a young player. And then where do they go contractually with him? My thought is uh, there's no reason to walk away from Kevin Porter Jr. Now there's probably also no reason to, you know, give him as much as a player might want at this stage. But I like the player that he is. I like the backcourt this could create. They both have good size. I think they both can be plus defenders. And I do think they have the makings. It's, it's a part of the foundation that clearly you add a big to it. And I, I think I wouldn't say you're on your way, but there is clearly something there if that happens. Yeah, his actual game is nothing to worry about. And as you just said, he acknowledges his problems off the court. Um, I think that's really important when it comes to self-awareness for young players. So it seems to be moving in the right direction if he's aware of it. Yeah, they're, they're, he's talked about it before the season. He talked about it when he arrived. But even with the knowledge of that and recognizing that and apologizing for things that happened, and some of the things that happen in game, in season, it's just you can't do those things. They just don't happen when you're a professional basketball player in the NBA. And for it to happen, it was a concern. And it is something that you wonder, is it something that's gone? Is it something that lingers? And there's all sorts of reasons why it may or may not you know, resurface, they're going to have a very large change in their coaching staff. It's very possible that only Coach Silas and Coach Lucas will return. That's what it looks like at this point. His relationship with those two guys is extremely strong, especially Coach Lucas. And I do think those are some of the reasons why there's belief that he will work out here in Houston and wants to make it work here in Houston. Offseason needs for the team outside of the draft. 
players that care about defense, players that <laughs> want to defend, want to realize that's where you're going to win games in the NBA. Having that second first round pick is huge. I mean, you're going to have six top 25 players drafted, presuming they hang on to it, over the past two seasons. And that really is kind of the foundation of your team. You see what K.J. Martin becomes. You see what you can do with Jay Sean Tate, whether he fits here or he can help you, you know, in a move. Same thing with Christian Wood. You may need a one veteran besides Eric Gordon to kind of keep things together. And it looks like, you know, Gordon will stay. But they were pretty limited up front. You know, Christian Wood's offensive skills – are top flight for a big. They're everything you could ever want in a big offensively. I don't think they fit particularly well with the current day of the NBA now defensively, and that's where they have to get better. Ben Carroll will help. Another big that comes in will help. Uh, that's where the focus of the roster uh, really has to be augmented. They, they just need more help up front. It's interesting Eric Gordon stay, right? It is. They must really like him because he could have helped the contender and they probably could, probably could have got something back. Yeah, there were offers, and I do think there were legitimately – good offers offers worth taking and I am a little surprised that it didn't work out especially with Phoenix because we know there was interest there we know there was an offer there and we saw what happened to Phoenix when yeah. they struggled to put the ball in the basket without any other perimeter creators uh so yeah, it was a bit surprising but he's he's always been kind of an you know he's he's the role he has here is pretty obvious and he's taken to it very well uh he stayed healthy for the most part over the course of this season that's always a concern but when that, you know, when it gets to January or February, again, that same position uh, will be sitting there for him. There will be contenders. He'll be going into having less money owed to him now at this stage of the contract. And I, I think he has to be really high on most people's list outside the league of, of a player you can add if he shows he can still play. I think he makes it into the season with Houston. Some people think he's going to get moved this offseason, mm. but I'm not one of them. Adam, great stuff. You're always welcome back on the show. Where can we find you on social media and everywhere else? At Adam J. Wexler on Twitter, on IG, and of course, as you mentioned, uh, on the iHeartRadio app on Sports Talk 790 in Houston, weekday afternoons, 3 to 6 Central. Thanks so much for taking the time. You're always welcome back on the show. Great insights on the Rockets. Talk soon. Appreciate it, man. Anytime.